Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you, and what a lovely song just to be able to sing, to just stir our hearts, to connect our body, soul, mind, and strength. And where I meet them these days, the first one is typical, what do you do? And uh, the second one is, how are you? I'm not sure which one is more important. But uh, to share with you what I do is I work under an umbrella of a book I wrote which I never thought would become, in fact, the theme and creed of what I do. And that is Ministry for Tomorrow, training and looking at whether the church has a future and whether your church or you as a leader have a future. So I look at subjects like Leaders for Tomorrow, position or function, releasing people into ministry. How did Jesus do it? Have you ever looked at that? Guidance from the pastoral letters, all four of them. Freedom for the future of ministry. Ministry until Jesus comes. And so that's what it's about. I've got a few here. These books, I've just got a bunch here with me. Uh, they sell for 150 rand each, and so if you want one, you can come and speak to me afterwards. But it's been so great to be able to speak with my two colleagues, uh, Brother Godfrey and Brother Piff. Uh, Piff and I have known each other particularly a long time, and we have worked closely with each other. We have sparred with each other, which is great and happen in our Baptist Union. When I saw what the committee was up to and the national leader phoned me and asked if I'd participate, I quickly put it together that they looked for an Indian to speak, <laughs> and then they looked for a colored to speak, <laughs> and then they looked for a Corsa to speak, <laughs> and they found me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't close, I'm now. They put my Corsa in. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Do you know that Corsas are going to lead worship in heaven? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> a Corsa white to a white Corsa, I'm not sure which one. <laughs> it depends who I'm talking to. Is that you need to come with gifts. Yeah. And uh, today I'm bringing you some gifts. And I bring you uh, honor today from two people who have been a support to me in a lot of what I do in terms of materials. And uh, the one is Brian Russell, who's a Baptist Union pastor for many years. Today he is 87 years of age, and he is totally blind. The last book he wrote, which was given out last year, a number of them were given out celebrating the 70 years of BTC, and he asked me to write a paragraph on the back, and it's on the book of Daniel. Mm. And if you put the book of Daniel together with the book of Revelation, those two books is almost some 600 pages on some of the most practical ways of how to preach uh, eschatology from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And um, these, I have some left over. And I've got a number of Daniel ones here. I've got a few on the book of Revelation, knowing it's not everybody's so-called cup of tea. But if you are an on-the-run, busy a senior pastor, and you can't read those two books, there is one called Christ Return as King of Kings. And this one is a shorter version. It came out first, in fact. And I actually made it prescribed reading for the eschatology class at BTC, and I've got a pile of them here. It will just help some of you, I won't mention who, to sort out the eschatology. And um, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're all pan-millennialists, eh? <laughs> at the same time, a man by the name of Dr. Bob Utley I've never met him. He is one of the most esteemed teachers. Um, hermeneutical theology, which means he is not punting a particular corner of theology or, or even biblical 
studies and uh, he has worked internationally and God spoke to him one day and said, give all your life's work away. And he got it put onto these two CD-ROMs which are now in various languages including Shona. The book of Romans has a commentary in Shona of some 300 pages. It has got about 10 commentaries in Afrikaans. And by the way, it is um, Cecil Peasley's son's wife's father, a Dutch Reformed <laughs> pastor. That translation was done in South Africa for you. And um, I got to college just a few uh, months ago and I, I did a, a chapel service there. And there's a Filipino girl who is in her final year and I gave these out and she came to me and she says, Oh, my language, my language. It's got all these languages in it as well. But for you English speakers, of course, Bob, Bob Utley being American and English speaking, pages each done hermeneutically, challenging you with the text as Piff was doing with us today and Godfrey a little earlier, challenging you on the test text. And I've got a number of the CD-ROMs up here. Um, and it has got a whole lot of YouTube uh, presentations and lectures by Dr. Bob Utley. And uh, if you still have a, a computer that you can still put the discs in the side, or if you can go and buy a CD-ROM that you can stand alone, plug it in, or if you don't do that, find somebody who does and you can transfer it all onto your hard drive. There's no copyright on this. And you can share it with as many. Or if you don't want to go that route and you've got a lot of data, you can go directly to his website and download everything. So folks, don't tell me you are not resourced. You have got a library in those two covers. And uh, I've got a bunch of them up here. And um, in a minute, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And then I've got this lovely book. It is just what we have sung. Jehovah is your name. The I am. If you want to preach on that in fire, this is a book. That it, these books are up here. If you have massive commentaries and you've got massive libraries, give others a turn. But I'm going to give you a chance now. Come up to the front, grab at least one book, wait until you can see if four. So one, two, three, four, go. Okay, let's settle down. I hope you saw, behold how they love one another. Let's bow in a moment of prayer together. Are you blessed? Yes. Amen.
Father, we just pray now that as we have learned the centrality of salvation and Jesus Christ, and as we have realized that you've come to fashion us into the person of Christ, we can't hold this to ourselves. And as my two esteemed brothers from over the seas who have written these commentaries and books and given of their CD-ROM information, Father, I pray we too might learn to give, for sometimes it is far better to give than it is to receive. And Father, I just pray that you would just take your word, the inspiration, both in my life and yours. And Father, I pray for each one, pray for our churches represented here today, and for our Baptist family. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. One Peter chapter two. Just by the way, I'm privileged to be able to have a copy of the Africa Study Bible. Please think of getting one of these. The work that has been put into it is so African contextual and first world expertise. Uh, a wonderful, they use the NLT translation and a number of scholars from north to south of Africa um, are represented of all that they have given in this volume. Therefore, get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have a taste that the Lord is good. Can you say amen? You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. And as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are you can now share Show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. I have some friends in, uh, who have been in farming for many years in the Elliott district, not very far from here, in the southern area of the Drakensberg and the northern area of the Eastern Cape. 
And they are sheep farmers, amidst other things. And um, in looking after the sheep, there is always one problem, and that is the security of the sheep. I can remember as a little boy going with my father, I must have been about four or five years of age, and my father just said to me, I could just see the mood on his face when he's to a neighboring farm, and uh, we were trading at that time, he was trading and he, he was called by a farmer to come, and when I arrived, I still have the battlefield image in my mind of what I as a four and a half, five year old saw in front of me. About 15 sheep lying on their backs and on their sides with their throats ripped open because one or two jackals had got into that uh, group of sheep and literally slaughtered into them. The question is, what can you do to prevent that? And something happened a few years ago, and this family that I know expended a lot of money to do it, and that is you purchase a Caucasian shepherd dog from Europe. And literally they send the dog over to South Africa, and it comes in a container, it, it is looked after, it is brought to the farm, there is virtually no human contact that is made with that dog. They take it up into the mountains and they take the dog, which then, um, when it's still quite small, is just a bit smaller than a sheep. And they release the dog among the sheep and they leave it there. It doesn't get fed by human beings. What human beings do is they put food into for eating. But the dog begins to believe it is a sheep. And it walks with the sheep. I was going to say, going back to Greg's old singing, he walks with me and he talks with me. I was going to say, he talks to the sheep, but he doesn't talk to the sheep. But he becomes a sheep. He grows to be an enormous big dog, now standing about a foot above the size of a sheep. Looks very much like a Pyrenees mountain dog. Begins to threaten the sheep. And the dog who thinks he's a sheep, something happens to him. He digs down deep. And he begins to instinctively growl. He begins to bark. And eventually he rushes out of that flock of sheep and either catches, kills, or otherwise barks and sends away. Something happens in the time and the moment of danger. Friends, this has been the burden story of me coming to be here today. Have we not too much identified as sheep? Has the time not come for us to dig deep down where when we see danger, when we see the devil, when we sun and growl again and bite again and bark again, Because of this, I want to take you just on a little journey onto the next slide of what I've come to discover that we can talk doctrine but not do doctrine. I've come to discover that we can talk and think doctrine but not missionally apply doctrine. And when I've looked at the life of Peter, I see a person in transition. And I wanted to take you to one or two of experiences in his life. And the one experience, and I've given you just two references so that you can get an idea of, of where it was. But I think you all know that a moment came in Peter's life, a person who had walked with Christ, 
a person who had seen miracles with Jesus, a person even brought into the upper echelons, Peter, James, and John's, and even confronted Jesus and said, Jesus, I will never desert you. Count your bottom dollar. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. Where Peter was even prepared to say to Jesus, I'm never going to allow you to go to the cross. And Jesus said to him, as they were sparring together, get thee behind me, sell when you need to growl. Learning to bark when you need to bark. And learning to bite when you need to bite. And the moment came when Peter, faced with the issues of the arrest of Jesus. And I want you to look at him biographically. I don't want us to look at just the letter of Peter as a form of literature. I want us to look at the person who is actually writing. And I want you to see how this person had to go through transition. In a circle, he had just cut off a disciple. He had just cut off a soldier's ear. He had just seen a miracle. He had seen Jesus. And he walks to warm his hands. A very human Peter. And a little slave girl listens to his accent. And he says, Wena, Gubani Nim Yazi. You're a Galilean, aren't you? Know him. And dear friends, I want to ask you today, and I've had a burden in my heart, and it might just speak to one or two or three or four, because I've been around pastors, that's what I do, that's where this takes me, it takes me all over the place, it takes me into the crevices of life. It takes me into secret places to have coffee with broken-hearted people. It takes me to post-lockdown. Do you know that we have been through a global crisis? Do you know that our churches are battling many cases to survive? And if you don't have a plan together right now, I can tell you, your church doesn't have many years to go before you'll close those doors. I might say, what are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is a lot depends on what decisions and what things you put into place here today. You can actually change that trajectory. And that's who I want to speak to for a moment. Is it possible that I'm speaking that somehow, under your circumstances, in your pressures, maybe sometimes brokenhearted, maybe absolutely lonely, not knowing what to do in lockdown times. Maybe, somehow, you've denied the Lord. And you don't know what to do about it. I want to show you what you can. So what does Jesus do when he comes to transition? My question is, what does Jesus do when he comes to churches in transition? He doesn't abandon his church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What about a denomination? Am I right or wrong to say that we're in transition? Transitions are not bad things. In fact, they're good things. Could it be this could be an assembly where inspiration is infused into the life of our members and our churches, and we see a new moment and a new time. It wouldn't be the first time in the world history of the church. So what does Jesus do? Peter says, I'm going to go back to what I know. Some of you have thought that already. He said, well, I know he's fishing. Go back to fishing. I don't know if you've ever read the text. The text says, Others joined him. Peter was the denier. Little did he know that there were a few of the twelve who joined him. There could be here today, maybe not those who so clearly know that you have denied Christ in some way, 
of your ministry. It could be you've got brothers and sisters who are secretly denying. Now, brothers, I refuse to judge people without giving you an answer. That's what Jesus said. He said, I have not come to judge the world. I have come to give life to the world. So what does Jesus do? He singles out the very person who has denied him in the shadows of the crucifixion. How would you like an elder like that? How would you like a fellow pastor like that? How would you like a colleague like that? He stands and faces Peter. And he puts a question to Peter. And it's in interesting how he puts the question. He says this in John 21 verse 15. Do you agapao me? Jesus actually pushes the boundary and he almost wants to see the reaction in Peter's life because Jesus is using a word reserved for God. For God so agapao the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a God word. Listen to what Peter says. You know that I love you. And I cannot love you sacrificially. But I fill AO you. Peter comes to a realistic point in his life. And he says, you know what, Jesus, you've asked me a loaded question. And I'm giving you an honest answer. Before this, I was the hero. I wanted to prevent you going to the cross. I give up. I am not God. Friends, say it to yourself. I am not God. But you love me, Peter, don't you? You're my friend. What Peter says, I can't give you John 3.16, but I'm on your side. It's very interesting how Jesus, after he sees that Peter denied him three times, restores him three times. He says, feed my sheep. He doesn't go through a whole disciplinary process even with him. He just says, listen, I think you've learned your lesson. Go and feed my sheep. And again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you agapao me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know. We've agreed. I follow you. No, I can't give you John 3.16. But I can give you my life. I can give you my friendship. And I can give you my service. The third time, Jesus has pushed him to the limit and he says to him, Simon, son of John, so you follow me? He says, yes, I do follow you. So you're my friend? Yes, I'm your friend. So I'm on your side and you're on my side. So what I'm telling you is, go and care for my sheep. I recently have been doing some research uh, through the book of Acts and primarily on the, um, the, the ministry of Peter and of Paul and of Barnabas and of James. Leading up to, and I'm just going to focus for a few minutes just on the Peter. Do you see what happens to a Peter in, in the book of Acts after he is Jesus? I will cancel every denial with an acceptance that I love you and I am willing to serve you. On the day of Pentecost, who stands up? Filled with the Holy Spirit together with all the others. It is Peter who stands up. At Joppa, who is the one who is revealed, to whom it is revealed that the Gentiles are no longer to be seen as inferior to Jewish people, but what God has cleansed, don't disregard what God has accepted and made clean. It is Peter 
who goes to Cornelius' house and he stands the test. When people came to him, how can you go to a Gentile's house? And Peter says, what happened to me on the day of Pentecost has happened to every single one of these. What does hinder me from baptizing every single one of them? He goes with Paul and he stands with Barnabas in the Jerusalem council. And he says, listen, gentlemen, you have come here and said, unless we be circumcised, we cannot be saved. You want to bring a surgical procedure and a theological construct to disbar the majority world. I want to tell you what, what happened to me has happened to every single one of them. And if God has given his Holy Spirit to them, what does hinder us from becoming ministers together in a body which is united under Christ? You might say, Pastor, weren't you given one Peter two to speak from? Well, let's go to one Peter two. I've learned from my pastor Byron: you preach a sermon before a sermon, and before the real sermon, you have three conclusions. <laughs> so that's what I've learned, my brother. I want to speak to you from one Peter two verses one to eleven on the subject of a people of promise. Say to yourself, I'm a person of promise. Say to your neighbor, you're a person of promise. Say to your other neighbor, you're also a person of promise. Do you feel what is just being said in this room? Therefore, Somebody once said, I remember in a class many years ago, I can't remember who said it, but I've never forgotten it. Whenever you see the word there. What has been said to you through our two brothers this morning is the premise or the foretaste of chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. Now, folks, can I get very personal for just a minute? I expect, as Piff was saying, to find a hostile word. I try and be persuasive, but I, I'm not surprised. What I don't expect is to find enemies of the gospel in the church. Union, rid yourselves. And if you want to go and look at the Greek word pante, pante all means all. In other words, there's no shady areas. Rid yourself of all. All means all. Slander. And in case you've missed it, of every kind. Like newborn babies. Who's more vulnerable? Crave spiritual milk. One commentator has said, crave uninfected milk without poison. So that by it you may grow up into salvation. Verse 3 says now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Friend, I want to ask you, have you tasted that the Lord is good? Heard you're not going to share that the Lord is good. If you're bitter against the Lord, you're going to share bitterness against the Lord. And you will just confirm all the negativity in your church. Taste that the Lord is good. He is the one who is in God. Discover yourself that the Lord is good. So Martin, how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, it's very important to get your doctrine right. You can't just believe in anything. 
And we have looked at what we believe this morning. You can't just do it any way. You can't do it the world's way. It's how you behave. We are very different, unique people. We get slapped on the one cheek, we offer the other. That's unusual behavior. You have to admit. There are two major things that I want to share with you today. In order for us to somehow become the people of promise in practical terms. And the place to begin is to take what we have heard today, what we have read from chapter 1 today, and to confess the one we serve. Let me give you just a few verses. In verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, say you also, also. like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This was the test that Jesus gave to his own disciples. He took them up into northern Israel and he took them to one of the most vulgar, vile places where uh, a kind of syncretism, a kind of barbaric religion was being practiced where a god in the form of a goat was said to come once a year out from a cave and they practiced all kinds of vile things. And Jesus takes his own disciples and he stands in one of these most vile, vulgar places on earth and he says, who are people saying I am? You know what I like about Jesus? Jesus is that he's open to hear what people are saying. He's not a dictatorial Allah who says, you touch me or my prophet. I want to hear the opinions of people. And you know what? People have got opinions. That's very good apologetics to actually find a common ground. And of course, they looked at each other just like disciples look at each other and students look at each other when a lecturer says, so what do you think? And they look at each other because they've been talking in the common room. And they've been talking behind his back. Some say that you were Elijah. Okay, I hear it. Some say that sometimes you look like such a burdened person, you like Jeremiah. I hear it. Some say that you John the Baptist, risen from the dead. I hear you. And he looks at them and he says, uh, Who do you say I am? Notice this passage in chapter 2 is addressed to you. Now you. It's addressed to me. And listen to Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, Christos. Thou art the Christ. Let's go into the world, the Son, as opposed to the Emperor of the living God. Remember behind me, all this stuff is happening. All this stuff is going on. And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood is not who is in heaven. It's very interesting how the interplay begins to take place when he goes on to speak. And he says to Peter, Peter, you are Petros. And on this Petra, see the interplay, I will build my church. 
You see, folks, it doesn't matter whether you've been through transition. It doesn't matter if you're in a place of hardship right now. It doesn't matter. But if you can confess with your lips that raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And let me say, and continue to serve. See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen, a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. 1 Peter 2 verse 7, Now to you who believe, stone the builders have rejected has become the city of Tswani, Shwani, is the little town of Cullinan. It's a beautiful, quaint little city. It's a nice little town to go to for a cup of coffee. It's a nice place to go and play a game of golf. But it's known for its world-famous diamond mine. A diamond was discovered there some while ago of 621.35 grams. The largest gem quality diamond ever discovered. Worth 6 billion rands. You believe that silver and gold are more important? No, Christ is more precious. You believe that this diamond is something worth having. I want to tell you, when you trust in Christ, you have a diamond, you have a rock that is far more precious. And in 1 Peter 1 verse 7 it says, These have come so that your faith of more precious than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. Will you reach deep down? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Will you in the face of danger learn to bark again? Will you feed my sheep and learn to bite again? Because you and me, we are a people of promise. The world is looking at us. The prophets are waiting for us with expectation. The second thing I want to share with you, consider your place and your purpose. Consider your place and your purpose. And verse 9 goes to that wonderful passage of Scripture. But you are a chosen people. What a wonderful passage that is. You are a chosen people. What does the word chosen people mean? It is a them I have chosen you in order to bless the nations. If you read in Acts chapter 9 verses 15 to 16, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Your choice is to be productive with the gospel of Christ. A royal priesthood because we are a priesthood under a king. We are not a priesthood serving in temples made by hands, even though Solomon's temple was a beautiful temple. No, Hebrews 4, 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tried and tested in every way, yet without sin. Therefore draw near to him boldly, that you might find grace and mercy. Don't you need grace and mercy today? See, if I said to you, listen, what we're going to do, 
is put you up and see how good you are, how bad you are. We all fail. But if I say to you, listen, if I could give you grace and mercy, we could. A holy nation, as was shared with you over half an hour on what holiness actually means. We are a holy nation. This is what makes us a people of promise. A people belonging to God. My big question is why? My big question is why? Just click on to the next slide. So that. Say so that. We may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. May I suggest that is our purpose. We are people of promise with a purpose. Can I just touch on, I've heard people threatening. I've heard people even saying that the Great Commission is built on verbs. You know, it's not. The Great Commission is built on Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, four participles, when you've seen the glory of Christ, when you've tasted that God is good, when you're automatic, baptizing is automatic, making disciples is automatic, and teaching them to observe is automatic. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, some of you were fearful of the ancestors, fearful of the witch doctor. And now you can stand and say, in Jesus' name, I stand. In Jesus' name, I stand. And now you have received mercy. I taught homiletics for many years and still try and be a good homiletician, a good preacher. And one of the things is you never have two conclusions. But I've learned from my pastor you can. <laughs> and I want to close with just perhaps, a, can I just have a, a one-to-one -one moment with you as a denomination. I want to propose that we just touch on, in a few minutes, the way that you and I could become people of promise with the future. In 2017, I published an article in our Baptist Journal, and I researched a question do Baptists have a future? And when I looked at the conclusions after researching a number of pages on do Baptists have a future, I want to share with you just a little bit of the conclusions I reached. First question I want to ask is, how are we doing statistically? Let me share with you some numbers. In one of my presidential articles that our denomination could fill up a rugby stadium, Ellis Park Rugby Stadium in Johannesburg with 60,000 people. I happened to be talking to a few people and it was mentioned in an executive meeting in 2017 
The question is asked, how many Baptists are we? And it was mentioned about 60,000. Talking to some people just the other day in 2022, the question I asked, do you think we're still 60,000 or more? And somebody said, perhaps less. I want to ask you a question in this world of South Africa. Can we not do better than that? Can't you be part of the solution? Can't you become a person of... The other problem was that I discovered was if you start to choose corners and you start to bring fallen, foreign, what I call franchise elements into a group family like Baptist Union, like we are, inevitably a fight will start and inevitably division will start and inevitably there will be a regression in numbers. May I quote from an article, or rather a doctorate that was done by Peter Christofides in his PhD research, and he said these words, the tensions between Calvinistic and Arminian, and there could be any, but he mentions this, resulted in a split in our mother Grahamstown church just after it was planted back in the 1830s or whatever it is. What I wrote in my article, funny enough, neither Calvin nor Arminius were Baptists. Now folks, we could multiply, it could be anything, it could be something. The thing is for sure, when people fight, churches don't grow. For your encouragement, I conclude that article by saying, Baptists into the future will be significant because Baptist principles and Baptist theology is one of the most transferable ecclesiologies in the world. Go and look at our colleges and non-Baptists flood to our colleges to learn good ecclesiology. <laughs> Professor Piff did a survey of students and discovered and asked why they were at our colleges. And they said, because you are Bible believers, anticipating probably you are the best growing denomination. <laughs> and do you know what? There's no reason why that should not be us. I not mind coming forward. And brother Brian Anderson, just come up and stand here in the front. Maybe Greg on this side. Brian on that side. Just stay on that side. I'm going to ask my brother who is on the piano. Would you mind just coming? Who's the piano man? You'd come onto the drums too. We need a little bit of drum. And maybe just that song, Jehovah is his name. Not going to sing it, but I want you to bow in prayer. And folks, I don't know, the Lord can only meet you at the point of your need and the Holy Spirit can only speak in the intimacy of our hearts. But you know who you are. You know what you're going through. And I want to ask you just one question. Do you want to be restored so that you can be a person of promise with a future? And folks, as we just bowed in prayer and not necessarily people looking around, not that there's anything wrong with looking around, I want you to do a Peter thing here and say, Lord, you've got my friendship and I will feed your church. Just as a sign and a symbol, I want you to step out of your seat, if that be you, and maybe just for a special prayer around two of our key leaders in our denomination. Step out of your seat, walk down the aisle, shake their hand, let them just say a word to you. And if there are more, turn around and go back. But would you come out and say, listen, I want to be restored today. I'm a person in transition. Just step out. Just step right out. Just say, listen, I'm going to be part of the solution. And I'm not going to contribute to the problem. 
and I believe we have a future and I believe I want to be part of the fact that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going back to my church with a bark and a bite and I'm going back with a growl in my heart and I will feed your sheep. coming up, standing here, maybe Godfrey come right into the middle. Just come past, just let these brothers just pray for you, just touch you.